Live stream, you should now be hearing me and uh, Ben and Matias are connected. I'm about to mute myself so that I can talk to the gather. It'll look like I'm talking and there's nothing wrong. Uh, it's just that I can only have my audio go to one, one uh, sync. Oh, someone said that the certificate for Gather just expired, like during the last break. So it's tough to get back in. When you say the certificate, you mean like their HTTPS certificate? Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> so you can get in unsafely, I think, but otherwise, no. Um, Gather is uh, pretty cool. I feel like we should pay them. Once I figured out the local chat to get someone's attention, I was very happy with it. Before that, I felt trapped in this little body. Like I can't do anything to. Yeah, you can't like tap on somebody. I think uh, in terms of technology, it's pretty tough still. When there were more than nine people and there was four, more than four people in one location, I, uh, things broke up. Yeah, I think that um, you know, if there were if there were ten people standing around live all talking to each other, you really couldn't do that. You know what I mean? You got to have like set up some order. No, uh, but if ten people stand there and one of them talks, then you can hear that one person, and that was not the case here. Yeah, and it, I think it's because like you know, there's it's like the classic Zoom problem of someone doesn't realize their mic is on, it's buzzing, etc. No, I think it's a problem of having several pipes. In. So in, in Zoom itself, if you have 50 people on, it's one pipe going back and forth. If you have data. Oh, I see what you're saying. You think it's like a tech thing where there's, um, yeah, that makes sense. Like a line is a very dangerous uh, data structure gather. You ought to be in circles. <laughs> So can actually everybody hear us now? Yep, yep, so we are live. We've got, um, let's see how many concurrent viewers. So we got 25 concurrent viewers right now and there's 42 on the gather. So we got to wait a little bit for people to synchronize. Yeah, yeah, we dropped off. Uh, uh, Robbie said this morning was 123 for the town hall. And yesterday for Kathy's talk, the peak I saw was 91 or maybe 97, I can't quite remember. Uh, it was smaller than I expected, given that it's worldwide, you could go from anywhere. And the time zones are kind of okay. Was this, was, I, I, I need to ask, I asked Christos whether his student was actually in Australia. I can't remember. Um, um, so he, uh, he's, he's at Evanston now. Okay. Um, he was in Australia when he made his draft, uh, but he just got back to Northwestern. Okay. Yeah, the time difference is awful. Yeah. Um, all right, we are getting to parity right now with the groups, so um, we will get started. So um, we've got our uh, last session of the day.
this is going to be made up of um, one talk and one discussion. Um, so the first is uh, a talk from Ben Greenman that will be about um, shallow typed racket. Uh, Ben's here. Say hi, Ben. Hello, racket. <laughs> and uh, we'll have questions directly after as usual. And then uh, after Ben, uh, we'll do an Ask Me Anything with Matthias, uh, where Matthias will answer uh, questions from the peanut gallery. Um, I, uh, I, people ask, why, why does the website refer to him as the CPS? This is the uh, Chief Philosopher and Shepherd. So that's the, uh, that's the official title that Matthias has in the Racket organization. So anyways, so you can ask any uh, shepherding or philosophy questions for Matthias. But what we'll do right now is I'll mute myself, uh, turn off the video for all of us, and then we'll go uh, watch Ben's talk and we'll come back and talk to him. Recall that as usual, you can type in questions in the global chat, the YouTube live uh, chat, uh, or you can type them in directly into the Google Doc and we'll be able to answer all of those questions. Okay, hi everybody. I've been working on a language called shallow type bracket. And here's the pitch. Compared to normal deep type bracket, shallow gives you the same types but weaker. And I'll tell you why that's a good thing. First, by the same types, I mean it's the same language of static types and the same type checker that you're already familiar with. So if you've taken untyped code and added annotations to it to get a well-typed deep module, then you can reuse exactly the same annotations and just change the hash line line and you have a well-typed shallow module. And then, on the other hand, if you currently have deep code that fails to type check, then you also get a type error when you switch over to shallow types. So the differences between deep and shallow start when we look at running a program. Here's the first example. On the left, we have a deep function, make random list, that promises to give us a list of strings. On the right, we call that function a few times over in an untyped record. So one possibility is that we can, when we ask for a random list, we get back a list where every element is a string. Another possibility is that we could see a contract error. So if deep communicates with untyped code while it's making the list, and one of those communications doesn't match the deep types, then we'd see a, a boundary error like this one. Now, on the left, we have shallow code that promises a list of strings. If we call this a few times from untyped code, we could, like before, see a list that contains only strings, and we could see a contract error due to shallow communicating with untyped. But other things can happen too. We could get back a list that contains numbers, or a list, or anything else. So here, the promised list of string is turning into a guarantee that we get back a list, but no guarantee about what's inside the list. Here's a second example. Deep promises a function that computes a string. If we call this make random function a few times from untyped code, if we get a value back, we can be sure that it's a function. And then if we call that function, we can be sure that it's going to give us back a string. Otherwise, the deep type will find the mismatch and stop the program. If we have shallow code that promises a function that returns a string, and we call that from untyped code, then any kind of result can come out. We might get a string, or we might get a number. Uh, so once we're in untyped code, that string promise does not apply. If we're in shallow code, though, we call make random function and we get back a function. We call that function and it tries to give us a number. Then the shallow type will stop it. They'll say, hey, I expected a string here, but I got something else. So in general, what's going on? Deep promises that once the value gets matched up with a type, either when you're compiling the program or at runtime if the value crosses a boundary, that type is a guarantee about how the value is going to behave everywhere going forward. So if you use the value here in deep code, or if you use the value elsewhere in untyped or shallow, the type constrains how it behaves. The shallow promise is much weaker. You can trust the top-level shape of a value. It's going to match the top-level constructor of your type, as long as you stay inside type code. But then once that value goes out to untype, all bets are off. If it comes back in, then it's going to be subject to more shape checks. But until then, it's free. 
So with these two promises, uh, we can implement Deep and Shallow with two different strategies. And I want to say thank you to Sam Tobin Hotchstadt and Michael Batusa, because they're the ones that really pioneered these two uh, semantics. So the deep strategy is to look at all the boundaries, the deep talks to untyped, the deep talks to shallow. Take the types of those boundaries and turn them into higher order contracts that fully protect the type. And the shallow strategy, completely different, is to look at every expression in type code and rewrite it to possibly have one of these quick checks <coughs> quick checks to make sure it has the right shape. So any place that a bad value could sneak into the middle of the type module, we have a quick check. And shallow does not have this big focus on the boundaries. So from these two implementation pictures, I can tell you the core competency of shallow type bracket is that it lets us mix typed and untyped code with no chaperones. And right off the bat, that gives us some big benefits. First, as you might have heard or experienced, deep types can be slow. Here's a two-module program that computes prime numbers. When both modules are untyped on the top, running the program takes about two seconds. When we switch one module to use deep types, then the same program takes 13 seconds to run. If we switch those deep types over to shallow just by changing the hash line, now the same program takes about four seconds. So that's a big improvement. And we've seen similar improvements in other benchmarks that we've been using to measure performance. So the middle column here shows what's the worst slowdown over untyped that we can get when we mix deep and untyped code, you know, all possibilities. So if there's 10 modules in the program, we look at all combinations where you know, some of these 10 are typed and some are untyped. Deep can get arbitrarily bad. When we mix shallow and untyped code and we look at all possibilities in the right column, the worst case in these benchmarks is 8x much better. A second benefit is that deep types can be very picky and this can be confusing. So you often see questions like this on the mailing list saying, help, type bracket rejected my program and I don't know what the error message means. Here's a tiny program that has the same error. On the left we have deep code that creates a box, gives the box type n, and then sends it off to untyped code. On the untyped side, we try to set a new value inside the box. And then the error message we see is stop. You attempted to use a higher order value past designer. There's a good technical reason for this, but the bottom line is it stops a program that looks like it ought to run. If we switch to shallow types, this error goes away. Typed code can send out a box to type any, and untyped code can mutate it. If shallow code later on tries to access the same box, then that shallow code is going to have a shape check to make sure that things aren't wrong. And that might stop the program, but before then, there's no errors to get in there. And now a third topic. Deep type can sometimes change the behavior of the program because of the chaperones they insert. So first, index of is a list function. If we give it list AB and value symbol A, it returns zero for us because that second argument matches the the first element inside the list. If we switch the same program, or we use deep types, and we give index of a precise type that says exactly what, what it's doing, now the same program returns false. It says, I searched the list that you gave me for, for the second argument, but I never found a match. And that's because the second argument didn't end up being the symbol A, but some wrapped value that enforces this polymorphic type. So we get not found instead of index zero. The shallow types, there are no wrappers. So we have the same behavior that we saw before talking to this untyped function. Index zero, because we found the element inside the list. No wrappers. Okay, so these are some of the many benefits that we get out of shallow type bracket. But before you get too excited, I want to stop and tell you some of the drawbacks. Because the deep and shallow have trade-offs. And in the end, we're going to need both. First, Shallow types can be slower too. Here's our prime number program, but now both modules are typed. When we're using deep types, the program runs even faster than it did with untyped because of the type optimizer. When shallow is fully typed, the optimizer still kicks in, but these shape checks slow the program down. And in this case, we end up taking about five seconds. So shallow is a little bit slower here than it was when it mixed type and untyped. And now, here's a few more benchmarks to back this up. 
if we look at the overhead of fully typed deep versus untyped, deep, deep is often on par and sometimes faster when every module is deep typed. That's the middle column. And then the right column shows when we have a fully typed shallow program, how much slower is it? And these shallow numbers are close to our worst case numbers that we saw before. And again, that's because shallow pays for every expression type code. It's a small payment, but it can add up. And the second drawback of shallow is, as we saw before, the uh, shallow types only apply in shallow code. So with our make random function we saw, sometimes shallow can miss a mismatch between a type and a value. In a larger program, this uh, missing check can lead to something that's much harder to debug. You don't know where your program started to go wrong, but eventually you wind up with some wrong result. And then, even if shallow can find the error and stop the program, it's nowhere near as good at giving blame information as deep types are. So the deep stronger guarantees is a much bigger help to debugging. So yeah, these are the drawbacks. And they're, they're definitely drawbacks. So again, we have this three-point space. And I want to end today with some recommendations about how do I choose, if I'm interested in type bracket, between deep and shallow types going forward. First, if you have a specific problem, if you have a program where the boundaries are slowing things down incredibly, or if you have some error that doesn't make sense with the deep types, then switch over to shallow, and both these problems should be fixed. And if you know that you want the full power of types, or you have a program where all the critical boundaries are between deep modules, and there's no expensive type done type communication, then switch over to deep and get the full power of the deep types. You get better optimizations and fewer runtime checks. And then a general recommendation is if you're migrating, you're starting with untyped code and you're moving it into type bracket, go to shallow first. Shallow should be more accessible, easier to use. And then once you've got the types worked out and the boundaries worked out, then think about switching over to the full strength of deep types. Okay, so that's shallow type bracket. It's coming soon, I hope in early next year. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. All right, Ben, thank you. Okay, hello. Okay, so we'll um, switch now to questions. Okay, so the first question is, um, this is kind of the opposite of what Peter's talk was about. So what Peter's talk was about was identifying programs that uh, use contracts and turning those in, uh, sorry, use, identifying programs that use uh, defensive programming, which are sort of first order checks embedded in the code, and then turning those into contracts. And what your work is about is kind of doing the opposite because what Type Racket normally does is it uses contracts and what you're doing is you're generating defensive programming. So which one of you is right? Oh, I thought Peter's work was very exciting. And I think that shallow Type Racket needs a Peter to come in and make it even better than what it is. So. Uh, right now, shallow spreads these checks all throughout the code that it sees. And if we had a Peter analysis, we could take those checks that are spread out that need to be there for the guarantee and bring them up to a central place so you don't double check things. Uh, I see. So basically, by embedding them in the code, you're enforcing the type system. But it would be even better to do that only on the boundaries, but in a way that is shallow relative to the deep way that type Racket currently does it. Yeah. And it's, it's going to end up not just being the boundaries, but every block of code could use checks lifted up to the top of it. I see, interesting. Okay, so on the next question, um, uh, do you think that there is, like how many variants of shallow are there? So you mentioned kind of two versions of typed racket, but I mean, aren't there like hundreds of versions of typed racket? You know, one for each depth inside of the, inside of the type that you're going to enforce? In particular, why don't you type racket people just give me what I want, which is no checks ever. 
you know, prove what you can at runtime, I mean, at, uh, at compile time, and otherwise just, you know, just use whatever Racket's normal runtime system is when it's unsafe. Yeah, absolutely. So we talked about deep Racket and shallow Racket, and there's a theory that goes behind these. So the formal guarantee you get with deep is that your, your type sound types, and your types are also complete monitors. The formal guarantee with shallow is that your type sound. So anything that guarantees just type soundness is another way to implement these shallow types. So yes, there's a big space of things that you can explore. Uh, the same paper that works out the theory also works out some other alternative ways to implement shallow. But we picked this one, the transient semantics, because of the no chaperones. I think it's a very promising direction. And as you saw, it gets rid of some errors that we currently have. That, yeah, very tough to explain. So this is kind of the, the weakest way that we can still get the power of shallow types. Great. Um, OK, so here's a question from uh, John, who says that uh, he uses deep typed racket in uh, one of his classes. And people write you know, programs that are barely 1,000 lines of code. Um, but when they run these programs in Dr. Racket with uh, debugging and debugging and profiling turning on, uh, basically, you know, you have to go make a pizza before your compile time is done. So does type, does a shallow type racket help with the compile time or is it only a runtime thing? John, I'm sorry. It's only compile time. It's exactly the same type checker that your students are already suffering with. <laughs> so, uh, you know, is there any hope for fixing that too or uh, alleviating that because you know that the checks aren't going to be generated anyways? No, uh, it's the same static types, right? We, we still want the same analysis to help catch bugs. And uh, we still need that to see. Uh, I see. We need the full type to protect the full program that you end up running, right? So maybe you explore a full expression, and then you need every part of that type to generate a new check. And maybe you only explore part of the expression, and then you could get away with fewer types. But either way, we need them all at compile time. and. I think in the end you you want them. I, I can't imagine a useful partial static type checker, but that's something we could talk about after. Okay. So another question: um, Does it make sense to mix shallow and deep typed racket together in the same way that a normal typed racket and untyped racket, sorry, an un and normal racket are mixed together? Like, is there a composition story between the two of them that is fruitful? Yes, absolutely. So shallow and deep can talk to each other safely. And the deep types are still deep, and the shallow types are still shallow. And there are programs, depending on how you're organized, this can be a good way to, this can be the fastest way to run your code. So the shallow code is good fit for talking with untyped a lot. So if there's a lot of communication happening, put shallow at the boundary there. And then the deep typed code can be off in another corner, you know, doing some focused computation. And then once in a while, it talks to shallow, which goes out to untyped. So yes, you can mix deep and shallow, and I hope that you do, and uh, we can find out other ways that it's a good benefit. Great. Um, so um, what's the story with optimizations for shallow type racket? Are the optimizations turned on, or, is, or, or should we assume that the optimizations are turned off because they rely on too much of the trust that you don't have? Optimizations are turned on, and I was very surprised to to learn how many I could turn on. So shallow can use the very top level of a type to do optimizations. And it turns out typed racket has about 15 different topics that it optimizes. And out of those 15, only two use more than the top level of the type. So dead code is turned off and deep access inside pairs. If you use, you know, cadatter, that doesn't optimize anymore. But other than those two, all others are turned on. And uh, why does dead code not turn on? I, it kind of makes sense why cadatter wouldn't work because that is you know, a deep property. But what's, what's with the dead code elimination? Yep, uh, dead code depended on a full type. So one example is you could have a, a case arrow function, a case lambda, but you give it a type that just has a single arrow. And according to that type, some of those branches of the, the case lambda are not accessible. But the shallow type doesn't give you that guarantee. You can still get into any branch once the function crosses to untyped. Hmm. Um, I'm going to read a question, um, and I'm going to try to interpret it as well. So someone says, can I get an expression that says what type it is expected to be to yield, and that's checked at runtime, but whose contents are not statically checked at all? So I think this means, uh, does shallow type bracket, because it allows you to put on, because it's going to end up with first order checks anyways, does this allow you to embed untyped code 
inside of type Dracket? Uh, well, we currently have the with type with type uh, form in type Dracket, which lets you embed untyped code inside typed. That and, might be what you want. And, and so uh, this, it sounds like this is just the, the feature that he's looking for. And uh, that's something that works in shallow and deep type Dracket. And we can talk after. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that that's the answer, Hendrik. Um, we're, so, you know, we talked about how there's all these different things. You have this paper. I know that you've been working on many different things for a long time, Ben. So like, what is, what are you like committed to do next on this project? Uh, get it released. <laughs> okay. But like after that, you know, what's like the next thing? The next thing after shallow. We want to understand how it's being used. Uh, we want to talk to more developers. How is type Racket working for you? Uh, how is shallow type Racket improving things for you? and then use the feedback to go forward. Do you think so, it would be good if we had some sort of survey of users of Type Racket? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> yes. So I sent a, there is a survey out right now asking how can Type Racket, you know, better suit your needs and experiences. If you've just heard of Type Racket and never used it, please fill it out. Okay, so the, the link is tinyurl Type Racket survey, but I'll post it in the gather. Awesome, great. Um, cool. So. Um, There's a question that I was expecting that I didn't get. Okay, go ahead. Let's hear it. Yeah. Well, Jesse asks, where is optional type bracket? And uh, the short answer is optional type bracket should be coming out alongside shallow. Okay. So you'll have three options coming forward. Deep types, shallow types, which are just type sound, and optional types, which mean nothing. Optional types are static checks only but they don't add any contracts or any runtime overhead. So it's a little different from the no check line that we currently have because the type checker still runs. But uh, those three should come out together and they'll all be able to interact. So yeah. let, me, let me make sure I understand what optional does. So if I have a program that uh, the type checker would fail on it, optional fails and, I, and I'm not allowed to compile it. Exactly. The only thing that optional does is it means that when your optional program interacts with the rest of the world, the untyped world, all bets are off. Yeah. And so that presumably means that there's no optimization. Yeah, there'd be no optimization in that optional. Mm, interesting. Uh, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Cool. And optional is a very uh, disappointing thing. You know, the, the original vision with deep type bracket was let's take all the guarantees we get from static types in a fully typed language, and let's bring them to interact with untyped code. So now we can have these two worlds together. And it turns out there's a lot of friction. So OK, let, let's fall back to stat shallow. Now, we still have type sound. That, that's something. But we haven't given up completely. Optional is giving up completely. And if we need to be there, well, so be it. But we're trying to pursue types with guarantees. And so uh, to, to go back to John's question, basically optional gives us slow compile time and slow runtime. No, no, no. Optional would be fast runtime. If, if you're optional and untyped, there'd be uh, no contracts to slow it down. What I mean is, is that... Uh, uh, no yeah, exactly. No, no optimizing. But it's not, uh, it's, not the, um, it's not the aggressive bad performance that we see sometimes uh, when there are these loops between uh, untyped and typed programs. Yeah, you won't see 14,000x with optional. Yeah. Um, so um, I think that a lot of people are familiar with tools like TypeScript and whatnot. Uh, can you help them categorize TypeScript relative to these different variants of type bracket that you've talked about? Um, because I think that uh, that's something that uh, maybe people don't understand that type bracket and these tools are not the same thing. Yeah, TypeScript and almost everything else you see with an industry language is optional. So MyPy, Flow, they're all optional. The types are a static analysis, and they mean nothing when you run the program. And it gets confusing because sometimes you hear that TypeScript is sound. Well, it's not actually sound. But what they mean by that is if you have a TypeScript program where every line is type checked, then you have type soundness. And that guarantee doesn't talk about interactions. Uh, but yes, TypeScript is optional. I see. So basically, the idea then is, is that there's this higher standard that we in Racket have been holding ourselves to with regard to type soundness. And this new thing that you're talking about, optional, will be a way of having typed Racket, sorry, having Racket be able to do the same kinds of things that we're seeing in industry languages, in addition to the even greater guarantees that it already provides. Yes. So we really have this slider going from untyped to weak typed to strong typed. And let's explore. 
Great. Um, remember how we, uh, how you alluded to the with type construct and um, people have been talking about this. And uh, just to make sure they say that uh, it seems that with type allows a typed region to go in untyped code. Okay, but not the other way. And what they're interested in is the ability to have, I have, my program starts with hashling typed racket. And then in the middle of it somewhere, I put some untyped code. So okay. it's really with untyped. I think that's what people are interested in. And so the idea then is that you, you know, you annotate what the type is going to be, and then that gets turned into a check. Mm -hmm. So that's the request that people have. Okay. Yeah, the only workaround I know for that is to put an untyped submodule in your program. But if you're interested in this anti-with type, please put it in the type racket survey so we know how much pressure there is to get this out as soon as possible. Mm, that's a great idea, Ben. Well, cool. Well, thank you very much, Ben. Um, we will now switch over to the questions for Matthias. Um, so uh, Matthias, turn on your video and we'll, uh, we'll go from there. I can't start. You must, uh, must be on your side. Oh yeah. Okay. So here we go. I've now given you permission to have video again. I'm on. Okay, great. So how are you doing today, Matthias? I'm great. I'm having a ball. Record con, rah, rah, racket. Very good. Okay, so... Um, oh, before we start, guys, everybody, you have to remember every question you ask delays the post racket con party. <laughs> so whatever question you ask stands between you and the champagne. <laughs> Don't ask too many. Very good. Okay. All right. So um, we were just talking about types. Um, and, uh, you know, Ben is obviously your PhD student and, um, people have very, people have questions about your strong opinions about types. And in particular, here's the first one, which is that what is your understanding of the word type? How would you define it? And do you think that your definition is different than other people in industry think about type and other people in programming theory think about type? Yes, um, in industry, uh, when I talk to young students who come back from co-op and have programmed in an untyped language and I ask them, would you prefer a type one? They go, oh yes, Big, and I say, why? And the answer is almost always the same because programming in a typed language with an IDE that fakes an understanding of types, when you, programming works like this, you write O dot, and then a menu pops up and you click on one of, those, one of those names that came on the menu and then a template pops up. And then in the arguments, you see the type and you fill in like it says number and it says, oh, uh, one plus I, a nice complex number, right? Or whatever, you know, if you fill in the template and it's great and they feel very comfortable filling in templates. And to many people, to many young programmers, programming has become filling templates. Uh, at the same time, so, so they're really good IDE tools to help you along and that's, they're type dependent. And, and, and uh, IntelliJ even interprets Python quasi types and doc strings for, for several generations now and acts like type, Python had types and Python was the most, you know, it was really untyped. Uh, so that's on the, on the optional side. And I will say, uh, I've heard this from the developers of optionally typed languages in industry. That's how, that's the driving thing behind it. The second driving thing is literally to types find typos. And that's a good thing. Uh, you don't, you, uh, programmers need this help to sit there for, eight hours a day on that job, four of them are dedicated to programming. And you have typos when, you, when you, you, you introduce typos when you program for four or five hours and you want them caught and the fast IDE catches them. Uh, very, very few programmer going back for decades really understand type sound. And so when Ben talked about type soundness, shallow is type sound and deep is type sound, I was cringing. I didn't want to turn on my video, but you know, I was cringing because programmers usually don't think about it, so very rarely. Now, when you ask sample questions about what would you like to, what would you like the, uh, the runtime system to do when you know, you're trying to take the square root of a string? 
Well, of course they want the bug. They want that one. They want an error message, right? And then you go like, well, what if it just returns the bits that are in the in in, in the seventeenth register of your machine? I mean, there are no seventeen registers anymore. But you know, what if we do that? And they go like, well, that's horrible. Like, so they understand at an intuitive level, but nobody talks type soundness. Very few people, very few regular software developers talk like that. If they if you if you give them the option, they go like, yes, I want it. And then. The last question you ask him is, "What if it costs you five bucks? If you, I mean, some amount of time, uh, when you when you when you get this property, they go like, well, there's a trade-off, and, and then and then there's a long discussion, and then and, and, and it peters up. Now that's the, that's the industrial side. On the on the academic side, uh, I think the John Reynolds, uh, Bob Hopper view of the world is types are the syntactic barrier, and they're basically proofs about your programs." And I think that is a beautiful, internally consistent view of the world. Now, but think about it for a moment. Every ML program will only run if you link it to an untyped, brutally untyped runtime library. So even ML, SML, was always a programming language in which you had mixed type and untyped modules. Now, what they did is they predefined all the contracts at the boundary to the runtime system and removed the power from the programmer to inject the same kind of boundary between other modules. So my philosophy has been, and that is uh, something that goes back to my time in Indiana as a grad student, give the programmers the power uh, and, and let, them off, or let, let them restrict themselves. So to me, types are similar to what academics see them as, but I think I think that sets of obligations, and you just saw that uh, in in Ben's talk, when when I write down in one module that there's a function that takes an int and a complex and a string and returns a boolean, you know that's an obligation, and if I hand this function out to J, then the obligation is on J to use this function correctly. And the obligation is on me to actually return a Boolean. If I suddenly return, hello world, then Che will be unhappy. Should be unhappy. Maybe he won't be unhappy. You know, he should be unhappy. There's no obliged to be unhappy, right? So there's an obligation that is injected as untyped and type components talk to each other. And these obligations accumulate. So I call types are obligations that accumulate on you. And, and every time you check something about them, that is charged. Deep checks discharge them in a much more, in a much stricter way, and shallow checks have to be repeated every time you extract something from a, from a structure. Otherwise, you can't guarantee that the, that this obligation is discharged. So that's to me is the view of types, and I think that actually is also the correct view of viewing ML types. It's just you can prove a theorem that the runtime system will never go beyond that. That's true for ML, for Haskell, for Java, you name it. So that's that's my my view of types. It's, so, uh, it's you know to reply to this a little bit. Uh, there's this uh, popular you know iconoclastic uh, view that uh, you know uh, untyped languages like Racket and JavaScript and whatnot. These are really weird versions of type languages. The so-called unityped idea that Bob Harper talks about. And you're almost saying kind of the opposite. Where you're basically saying all those type languages they're actually really untyped languages because they have to interact with an untyped um, you know, runtime system and substrate that they run on. Uh, so basically, we have two, two, uh, you know, companies, and each one is saying, you're really me. And, and the other one says, well, no, you're really me. And this makes me wonder whether or not there's some, uh, I mean, obviously, we know that Matthias is right. Okay, but, you know, we could imagine that maybe Bob was right. But is there some, you know, third perspective that looks at what we're both doing and finds what some sort of fundamental difference between it? Or is it just a different way of looking at it? You're focusing on the obligations that must be checked, that we may be able to eliminate those checks statically. And on the other side, we have the view that there are proofs and some of these proofs just have to be trusted. And that's really what like the base type environments are about. They're about uh, proofs that are like axioms. So. Uh no. I'm saying two things. So do you think that there it's possible for there to be a third perspective? And what's your take on this, where each side says that the other side is really just a derived version of them? So, um, yes. Yeah. So Dana Scott already in the 70s introduced this idea that 
untyped languages are just unitype languages. And, and Bob, of course, is a colleague of Dana Scott, has been promoting this view uh, ruthlessly for 25 years now. Uh, I didn't say that. I didn't say I'm the opposite. I said, I am a mix. I believe it, languages are always mixed and there is no way around. Yeah, so, so I'm already the synthesis of a view. The opposite view is Python or, or other dirty languages that really don't understand types at all. Uh, so, so in my mind, my, my view, the mixed type view that all programming languages come with a mixed approach to typing. You have some untyped code and some type code is always subsuming both. It's, it is in, in the Hegelian sense, it's the synthesis of an, a thesis and an antithesis. Uh, so that's definitely there. Um, if you look at the static, if you look at the restrictions that SML imposes, you actually, even there, you don't, you do turn on some safety checks, some contracts at the boundary. For example, an ML module will hand over an array indexing to assembly code, to the untyped part. And it could be, it could be written in Lisp, actually. It was written in Lisp in Big Blue, for example. And if it's written in this untyped language, you at the boundary run this check. Is the index within bounds? There's no way, otherwise you can't trust any proofs because the nonsensical proof could propagate through the world. A different view would be, uh, there's, a, there's a philosopher logician called Pfefferman at Stanford for a long time who promoted this view that everything starts untyped. So, so did in principle New Pearl, the, the proof assistant at, at Cornell that Bob's advisor built. Everything, the whole world is untyped. It's an untyped universe of sets and you build types on top of that. And the other view, the dual view that, that Jay alluded to is the view of other uh, uh, people, people like Martin Perleuf uh, or Tate, or uh, um, what's our French friend? Uh, um, uh, Girard. Girard. Oh, yeah. uh, those people see the world primarily typed. Everything is typed. And, and, and I just think if I look at the real world, the absolutely real world, there's nothing untyped and there's nothing typed. You can, of course, put your fingers in the outlet. Nothing prevents you that. And then your, your kids will have you know, a shock, an electric shock. Uh, and, and if the world were typed, it wouldn't happen because with statically checked, you always put the proper plug in the proper outlet. Uh, so so I, I, that, that's why I believe Pfefferman and people like this were right. And, and, uh, and the people who think of a, a universe is typed, it's just, it's just bogus. Mm. So follow up on this. Um, I think many people would say that mathematics is naturally typed and programming languages are just creative mathematics. I believe I've read that in a book that uh, someone uh, that I know wrote. Um, so do you disagree with that sentiment or do you not think, or, or maybe you agree with it, but don't think that mathematics naturally is typed in this way. There's this idea that, you know, programming languages as math versus programming languages as code and code is like what things do and thinking about how things run. Can you kind of reply to this idea? Uh... So what I was, Feverman is a mathematician. He was in the math department at Stanford and he, he believed that mathematics was built on top of untyped worlds. Uh, if you think about the number system that we have, right? Mathematicians deal with numbers exactly like racket and scheme and Lisp deal with numbers. We don't have a, we, we, we naturally go from byte style numbers to integers to rationals to reals to complex and back down. We don't see the boundary as hard boundaries. You, you can't do that in a language that have static types the way they were built by the uh, disjoint type people, the, the type mathematicians. And the whole idea behind the hot stuff that came out in the last 15 years, you know, high, uh, homotopic type theory, that is in some ways, they're actually trying to build a type, mathemat uh, type mathematics. Type mathematics was not typed initially. It was untyped. And types are used in the same as us. They're sets, they're soft boundaries that you know you don't cross. End of story. Hmm. So um, we've kind of been talking about uh, these like two kind of dual notions about what program languages and code is. I want to bring, I want to ask you about a, kind of another notion of duality. Uh, so, you know, your namesake, CPS. Uh, so continuations, they are the dual of values, right? So there's this idea that there's production 
which is what values are. And then there's consumption and the continuations are consumption. Right. So like Andre Felinski's like 1989 master's thesis contains all of these very deep ideas about how to build a programming language that simultaneously deals with continuations and values with as much um, as flexibility, you know, freely in a way that not programming languages don't really do. Um, so I'm very curious about what your perspective is on whether or not continuations and a language like this like is valuable or useful? Do we just not know enough about it? Um, I think that many people, when they hear continuations, they think, okay, well, Racket does continuations in the web server and that's kind of cool. And maybe they've heard of continuations in some other small little place. But basically continuations are this weird esoteric exotic thing. And this dual way of thinking about the world tries to make them uh, front and center all of the time. but program languages don't actually work like this. So why do you think that is? Why, why do you think continuations are so hard for people to understand? Is it in people's minds or we haven't built the right language yet? Uh, I don't think, I don't think programmers think in the terms of symmetry that Filinski hindered at, at his master's thesis. And Filinski to his credit kept working at it and tried to finish a doctoral thesis along those lines. It didn't quite work out, so I finished something different. And he's, he continued to work on this, but he has not produced a programming language. Um, I think a closer take on that, uh, 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 something that almost works in those direction is called by push value by uh, Paul Levy. Uh, again, a completely theoretical model that one of my colleagues in the lab has, Amal Ahmed, has used for uh, she and her student Max New. Uh, he's defending tomorrow dissertation. I think that's a Zoom, Zoom thingy somewhere, so you can, you can log in and hear about call by push value and how useful it is as an intermediate compilation language to, to build theorems. Uh, so I believe this view, this duality on the symmetry that, 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 that Filinski pointed out and, and people knew about it in some ways, but didn't quite handle it. Uh, and that Paul, uh, Paul Levy did, I think the symmetries are good for theoretical thinking but I don't think that's where software developers sit. And that's, I don't think that's where programmers sit. Uh, my own view of practical uh, continuations has dramatically shifted over time. When I, when I did my dissertation, of course, I, I, I was breathing continuations. I was eating them for breakfast and I fell asleep with them. Uh, you know, five years later, you realize they are, have, they are important. Uh, uh, you shouldn't have a language without them. But maybe they're not as important as you thought when it was the only thing in your dissertation life. And, and, and so... <laughs> I think we've, we, we will find time and again, we will find uses where it's just natural. And, and I will say uh, in the web, I didn't first realize how natural they were. And, and uh, Christian Kenek and uh, Shuram, uh, who picked up on that work, were, were ahead of me there. And we built this thing and we're like, oh, yeah, this is really cool. Uh, it works out. And so the, the, the Raplin Dr. Racket has really cool applications of or really cool use of uh, the limited continuations and when Robbie can tell you talk talk about this and so there are corners where you really want those things uh, and then every every 10 years somebody comes up with a cool with a cool new uh, uh, trick in a product I have generators well I mean we all knew that icon had generators in the late 70s so it's not like Python invented that but we go like, oh it's a macro now world you know boom there's everything is a macro so you know if you have a rich enough language and the language, for example, the core of the language contains continuations access like we do, and which will be cheaper now in Shea scheme, hopefully, then you definitely have the idea that everything is a macro in the end. And that, that's the real goal that we have to have, that developers need to realize that if the language doesn't quite support an idiom, well, we can build it for you. That's, that's much more important than having continuations. Great. Um, okay. So, um, Kind of a, a similar um, vein of what we've been talking about so far. Um, you gave a talk uh, on language oriented programming in Cadiz. And one of the things that you said was you said that we in this world are suffering from object oriented programming um, <laughs> as kind of an offside comment. W what did you mean by this? How exactly are we suffering from object oriented programming? Isn't object oriented programming beautiful and wonderful? Isn't it just, you know, uh, church encoding of interfaces? <laughs> 
Okay, so if you read the history of small talk, written by Alan Kay about, I'm going to say 25 plus years ago, you will find that we are at heart object oriented programmers. One of the first commandments in bold faces, the goal of object oriented programming is to avoid assignment statements. You have to let that sink in. The goal of object oriented programming is to eliminate assignment statements, right? But what happened in the real world? Well, old men got hold of, I mean, I mean old-minded programmers got hold of object oriented programming, quote unquote object oriented programming, and polluted it like crazy by just wrapping new keywords around the existing old Fortran code. And most of you are too young to know how to spell Fortran, but it really was an awful way of imperative programming. And object on programming became a more awful way because it was, there were more keywords in there. And so what we, what we then suffered from was that after the Lisp wave and the AI wave in the early 80s, object on programming won because they were able to do incredibly good marketing, but not the good version of object on programming one, the bad one won. The old people mindset object on programming one. They won by having the marketing, we can build extensible software. In the early 90s, people that realized software is never finished. You need to be able to go back and glue more code on top of it. Well, we can do this in OO. And so this OO thing that was a beautiful idea at the beginning became this incredibly successful, ugly piglet. And, and we are suffering from this mindset because it deep down, it just promoted this old imperative view of programming. And you can see this when students come back from co-op, they have this, the same mindset again. Oh, it's just, you know, a bunch of Fortran statements and with me wrap class around it and it's all, it's all beautiful. That's what I meant with that. So in, in principle, functional and optional programming is do a dual to each other, just you know, in, in the sense that the only thing that really, so you have modules in one sense, you have an abstract type inside, you have functions in type. On the other side, you have an, you have, you have an interface with objects, which is the module. The function is distributed over a bunch of methods. So what's the difference? The difference is dynamic dispatch. They remove the conditional. If you, if, you, if you bring the conditional back in object oriented programming, you have exactly the dual of functional programming. So when do you think it's better to use the functional perspective versus the OO perspective? So, I mean, you know, we both know about the expression problem where these two, you know, different ways of thinking about the table. And there are many people that have tried to say, well, here's the solution to this. My personal opinion on this is that there's no solution. There's just some problems that make sense to think about rows and sometimes it makes sense to think about columns. How yeah. should people in the audience think about this from your perspective, Matthias? Oh, that's, that's really cool. Um, so I, I have one, one semester of extreme programming experience every year. It's a course I call Software Dev. I tell the students to publish their project. I publish, I, I create a new one every year. Uh, and over time, I've experimented with a bunch of styles. And what I started uh, at some point was I, I have, I, I, as I said before, I have a module with a quote unquote algebraic type and a bunch of functions on them. I mean, I sense that I'm really, really programming in OO style. I actually refactor this module into an OO thing uh, because I have more than one implementation. I have uh, maybe inheritance is actually helpful. And I can give you, an, I'll give you a concrete example in a moment. And then other modules that are start that way, they stay that way because I don't see a use of inheritance. I don't see a use of multiple implementations of the same OO interface. And then there's a third part of my code. The, the code is about, you know, 5,000 lines every year or something like that, that I intensively written in a bunch of test harnesses around that. And the third kind is when I write the GUI interface to an observer or a player. Uh, is, and and, and that, that is of course, you know, GUIs you start, naturally start from our OO framework and there's very little escape. I try to escape when I can, but I, you know, that's, that's what Matthew built and, and so I use it. Give me, let me make this a little bit more concrete. Suppose you write a play, a, 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 an AI player for a board game. 
And you have a bunch of functions that the player does. For example, the player may have a game tree and explore the game tree and then deliver the next turn action. So in principle, the player is just start the game, deliver turn action, give me the state of the game and I, I tell you what I'm going to do next and maybe shutting down. You know, that's this typical thing. So you have that sitting there. But now you realize, well, if you really want to test your distributed game system, you want to create players that are like that, but they break at strategic places because you want to see whether the students figured out that you could time out or you could return a bad result or that you could maybe raise an exception and deliver strange things and stuff like that. So obviously you want something that's like the player, but not quite. That is a hint that says, let's turn the player into a class and derive bad players that break at strategic points in those four or five method calls that you have now. And of course, what that means is you have a base player with a good player on one side, and then you have a bunch of other players and you can lift some of the, uh, some of the functionalities maybe in the base player already, right? That's an example of when refactoring is like, oh, you know, that's where OO really works out. But then other modules like representing the game state, representing a game tree, they're all just one implementation. You don't derive anything. It's a, a plain old algebraic type with a bunch of functions on them works out fine. That's my programming style that I found over the 25 years I've been teaching this course. And it really works well that, that we in Racket have always had an, an object system, different one. <laughs> every, every release is a new object system, remember that. <laughs> and, uh, and that we had a functional core, you know, and that, that's, that's how the programming style for, involved for me. And I believe that many other people program that way too. Cool. Um... Okay, so if people like uh, listening to you and they love programming in Racket, are these the kind of people who should get PhDs? Should just everyone who loves programming get a PhD? Is that what a PhD is for? No. So <laughs> let me explain my title, Chief Philosopher and Shepherd, at least the first part. So Matthew takes care of Racket, but Racket is, is Racket in the sense of the Racket core language. And he's done an amazing job. Uh, my role has been to think of Racket as a programming language in which you make programming language. And that was the original conception in some ways, maybe not exactly like we do it now, but it was, it was the, 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 at conception, we had this idea. And so what I've been doing, I've been producing PhDs that look very, very deep into macros like Ryan Culper, but I'm sure maybe if he's still awake in Prague, uh, he's the last PhD who has produced uh, a macro-oriented uh, dissertation. Michael Ballantyne, who is currently working on the same, on a similar idea, macros again, will be the next one. And so to me, working on these very deep ideas has been this, this cool thing about PhDs, right? Um, the same for types, of course. We have had three type dissertations in the last 10 years. We had uh, about four contract dissertations in the last few years, last 20 years. So what's the, so the depth of that is what is a PhD. The PhD is not for people who need to earn money. I mean, I personally came up from a very poor family when, when I grew up and, and uh, it was better when I, when I came here, but it was still, you know, hey, you know, you can't just waste the time. Right now, think about it. If you are an undergraduate in the Boston area and you're an average programmer, you probably get an offer for $100,000. And if you're good, you get an offer for maybe 150. dollars And if you're really good, you can make 200. I mean, I don't, don't get me wrong, not, not everybody, like a few people, maybe one or two of our graduates go out and make $200,000 $200, first year. So if you multiply this by five, you lose a million dollars. So if you if you don't if you can't stomach losing a million dollars, you shouldn't do that. First thing. So that that's an obvious advice. The next thing is what what you want to be able to PhDs are for people who care about playing with problems and going so deep that nobody can follow them. And then if you have an advisor like me, they recover to the point where it becomes useful contributions to programming language so that other programmers who actually do earn a lot of money uh, can, can, can use that trick. But what's hidden underneath the type system that Ben developed and that Sam developed and that Sumo developed, that that's never gets into production. So 
So yes, if you if you want if you want to really just think about programming and programming well, then you want to do an undergraduate degree at an institution where people care about producing good developers. That's very rare. Most most academics can't program. They're programming LaTeX if they program at all. Uh, most pro, most academics run away from teaching programming heavy courses, and most academics don't like to think about what it takes to develop good code. But if you find one of those places, you get a good undergraduate degree, you're in good shape. Cool. Um, so one of the things that we uh, you know, reflected on this morning after 25 years of Racket is the way that some of the uh, ideas that were at the conception, as you mentioned, um, uh, have come to fruition. For instance, having quite a big impact on computer science education and being able to realize this idea of the you know, extensible language and building the tower of teaching languages. Now, one of the goals at the beginning was to make Dr. Racket a, um, you know, a very useful tool for uh, beginning programmers. And it presents a very intuitive um, uh, editor that, you know, you can spend a year getting Emacs set up to be almost like Dr. Racket and it's almost okay. And so one question that I have is like, you know, we saw the survey this morning that there that Dr. Racket is the most successful, the most popular of all of the editors. Thank you, Robbie. <laughs> yes, that's great. But does this mean that maybe Dr. Racket has kind of like failed as a teaching tool because it's too successful for professionals? I mean, one of the things that I find really remarkable about the structure and interpretation of computer science curriculum is this idea that uh, languages that are for professionals aren't good for beginners. And is Dr. Racket too useful for professionals? Does that, do you think that there's any conflict between the way that Racket started off being teaching oriented is now so um, productive for professionals? Has this compromised the teaching mission at all? Uh, let, me, let me correct you first. Racket was never, or PLT scheme at the time, Racket was never intended to be the teaching language. We knew from the beginning, uh, well, I knew from the beginning that we wanted a different teaching language. Uh, we didn't know all the reasons why we wanted a teaching language. So when I said we wanted language on programming in the beginning, the idea was that we should be able to produce a bunch of languages easily and very quickly inside of Racket. So I had experience before. We, we, had, um, we tried this once before in an Emacs mode because I started teaching undergraduates before Matthew and Shuram showed up at Rice. And a, a PhD student of another advisor, Rene Rodriguez was his name, tried to build a transparent, we call it a transparent programming environment in Emacs because I had observed students for days on end and struggling with Emacs. Emacs is, a, is an amazing power tool. I did everything in Emacs at the time, read email, run shell programs, eat lunch. I mean, you name it, I did everything in Emacs. Uh, and so I believed in Emacs. It was almost a demigod, you know. And then I realized students could not deal with it. And so I built, I, I tried to build an inside of Emacs, inside, in, in, inside the Emacs system, ecosystem, a, 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 a transparent IDE like, like what Jay just described. And we spent a year and it didn't work. Uh, what I also did is I observed students in lab. I mean, you have to understand at Rice, we got the third best students in the country, measured by SAT scores, whatever that exactly means. <laughs> so the first, the number one was Caltech, number two was MIT, number three was Rice. Students of that intelligent stumbled over simple, stupid syntactic conventions that I loved. So it was obvious we couldn't do that. So uh, we built Racket, or Matthew built PLT scheme as, as, as Racket's na original name, born name was, to build languages inside. We also, in the same spirit, wanted to cut down the, cl the clutter you see in an IDE. And Robbie succeeded tremendously with that. Uh, I believe the number that we saw this morning is misleading. I believe many, many people, many, many more people use Emacs to program uh, Racket than, than, uh, than Dr. Racket. Um, if you think of real professionals, um, I, I, I don't because I eat my dog food. Uh, so I, and, and I, and I saw, uh, Robbie, don't, don't listen for a moment. I actually sometimes switch from Dr. Racket to Emacs, do some things there and then go back to Dr. Racket. Okay, now you can listen again, Robbie. 
uh, so, so it's it's that. So did 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 Dr. Racket is still an amazing place to get students started. There's no question. I see this every year when I watch students, when I observe students, and how easy it is for them to build an interactive distributed game, this interactive distributed game in the first semester. Where else can they do that? Right? That it just doesn't happen. And Dr. Racket is an essential tool for that. I believe as a professional environment, as an IDE that has grown up, Robbie has really figured out the right take on it. Dr. Racket is an ID, an idea. And the idea is, is migrating into other IDEs. We have seen other IDEs pick up ideas from Dr. Racket, and we don't have the tools. We just don't have the number of people to build Dr. Racket into one of those amazing IDEs that runs you know, like, like other people, because they're produced by companies, they're produced by small groups of, big, big groups of volunteers. We don't have that manpower. But everybody out there who wants a better Dr. Racket, contact Robbie, Robbie will assign your work and we'll go from there. So no, I think, I think we're on a good track. Dr. Racket is still okay um, and we'll go from there. Awesome. Well, uh, so this has been fun conversation. Um, God has survived. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, there's no more, uh, you know, there, uh, you know, maybe there's a few more questions that we can have in the discussion area, but we'll uh, convert back to the gather now. Uh, there's no more, uh, there's not going to be any more live streams. This is the end uh, of the live streaming part. Um, I'm extremely grateful for all of the um, speakers who have been working with me for m maybe about two months now on their presentations. So they've all done uh, they've all done a fantastic job, and I want to give you know an, a super round of applause uh, to all of them. We couldn't really have RacketCon unless we have all of these speakers, um, and you know it's remarkable that we can just uh, you know fish into the racket community and get uh, so many amazing talks, people doing fantastic things, and um, of course we'll have RacketCon next year as well. And if you have uh, things that you want to present, you can. Uh, email me and you can say, I am going to work on this thing during the next year. And maybe we can have uh, you as one of the speakers next year. So um, I think that's all. Thank you, Jay. Wonderful job. I'm going to clap right through the microphone. I'm the only one clapping, but uh, it was heartfelt. Thank, Thank you very much for organizing. Thank you very much. I will um, see you all uh, in Gather Now. Uh, have a great weekend. <laughs>